All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Rob Ashton from all the way across the pond, as they like to say here, in the UK, in Brighton on the coast, beautiful part of the world. How are you doing, Rob? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me, John. It's great to be here. How are you? Yeah, I'm fantastic. And Rob is a writer who focuses on the hidden brain science of how things we read and write influence what we think and do. And your research in cognitive and social neuroscience, cognitive and social psychology and behavioral and neuroeconomics gives you a unique insight into how written communication works or is it? so often doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, so Rob, what we're going to talk today about is um, how decisions are influenced uh, by the way you write. And, and just to kind of baseline all of this, uh, I don't think people today understand the written word very well, because we live in a very casual culture today where it's like acronyms and it doesn't matter if you misspell, it doesn't matter if there's no structure, all of this so people people don't pay attention to it and yet a lot of the you know and yet we are reading and receiving information every day from people but we don't we don't understand how the ones we write to are are receiving what we write because we don't pay it that much attention yeah yeah that's right uh, I, I, th I think part of the problem actually is we don't even think of it as writing at all we we write more now than at any other point in our history um, John, are you still there? Oh, yes. <laughs> sorry. I've, I've lost you. I can't see you. Oh, you know, it's okay. Um, sorry. Um, I do, uh, I do one on, you know, I split the screen. All right. No, you're, I was slightly unnerved too, cause you were crackling as well. Um, I was. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that's just my end. Um, I don't know either. Is, is it still crackling? Yeah. Not, not at the moment. No. Okay. Um, I can pick up from that. I can pick up straight yeah, just, from that just, question. If you yeah, like. just pick up. Right? I'll, I'll just yeah, I'll just edit it out. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem, John, is that we don't think of it as writing at all. We we write now more than at any other point in our history. Writing is everywhere from from the the moment we. Um, we wake up in the morning and we turn and check our check our email uh, to w when we finally put our phone away and switch off the light at night. We are writing all day. We're, we're writing text messages. We're writing emails. We're writing on social media. Uh, we're using messaging and messaging apps um, as well as the things that we would have written before, like like sales reports and, and proposals and that kind of thing. And yet. It's it's something that we didn't evolve to do, and this is this is critical. It's not so much the grammar and punctuation, or even the or even the acronyms, as long as your audience understand understands them. Um, so much as the effect of the written word, because we our brains when we're born, our brains are not set up to to read and write. Now that may sound obvious, because mm -hmm. obviously babies can't read and write but our brains are set up to speak and listen. Babies can make themselves understood very clearly, or at least they can get attention very easily. Yep. It's, you know, the, a baby crying is probably the, the one of the hardest uh, sounds for a human to ignore. Mm -hmm. um, and humans, you know, as babies, we pick up spoken language naturally just by listening, but that's not the case with reading and writing. It takes 10 years to learn to read and write. And that's because we have to join together parts of our brain that we evolved for other purposes. So we're creating a network in the brain that's entirely artificial. It's not something, it's entirely natural, if it, unnatural rather. Um, and mm -hmm. and it's, it takes a lot of, of energy. You know, reading is always effortful. Now you can't ignore a single word or you will, once you learn to read, if you see a word, you will read it. But if you're reading a document or you're reading a, a text message, then, Often you're operating at the limits of your capacity, even though you may not realize it. And that's where so often it all goes wrong because you're already on your limits and you may, may have, for instance, little capacity left for emotional control or for, um, for good logical decision making. 
Yeah, you know what's what's fascinating fascinating about that is if you think about it when you know pre internet, even pre computer, almost days when we're processing and all that when we were growing up, um, the amount of attention you paid when you did it with the pen and paper or whatever, you know, if you're writing a letter or a communication to somebody, you pay you paid enormous amount of attention to it. You went back and reread it. You make sure it's all of that. Uh, everything was good. There was a certain gravitas around it. And that seems to have, that's kind of gone because as we treat these communications as super casual or instant is better, so it doesn't really matter. And and I think we've we've lost the ability to kind of self-critique. Yeah, well, if you think about it, writing used to be fairly difficult. I mean, logistically, mm -hmm. you know, if you were yeah. writing a letter, you'd have to get a, a pad, pen, and you would write something out and you'd be thinking about every word. Um, if you were typing then again, it would be a fairly slow, fairly laborious process. Uh, and even back in, you know, back in the days when I, when, when I started work, back then it was still a case that you that there were people who were dictating and sending sending uh, letters to a typing pool. Uh, I mean, I was yep. only just at the end of the, you know, I was right mm -hmm. at the end of that, but I, and I thought it was crazy at the, at the time, but but they were still doing it. And, and now. Now we can just tap away on a keyboard, not just on a, a on a, a physical keyboard on our desk, yeah. but on a, a virtual keyboard on our on our phone, and we could be anywhere. And it's that ease that causes the problem. I mean, this issue with grammar and punctuation, you know, you, absolutely, grammar and punctuation. If you don't get it right, um, if, if you don't get spelling right, that then it can it can really undermine your credibility. So it's important. But what I generally say to people is that grammar and punctuation is to uh, is to communication what brushing your teeth is to um, to human interaction. You know, it's it's you'll notice it if you don't get it right or if you don't do it. Um, but it's not really something to build a relationship on. Uh, and so, but what what we have though is this this kind of instant connection between our thoughts and the other person you, you know we've got the what happens is we you know we're connected to them through our screens not like we are but 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 mm -hmm, you know, yeah. through, through our keyboards um then the, the, it, but but it, we are actually operating alone so if, if you were speaking to somebody if you if they were in the room or or even even on zoom or teams um then you would you would know you would that is a much more natural way of communicating uh you could for a start you can correct in real time you can see how someone's reacting you can mm -hmm. you can use nuance but also there's evidence that when when you're doing that the uh the neuropeptide oxytocin is released which controls adrenaline blood pressure you know various uh various responses and is central to human interaction but there's evidence that when that with written communication oxytocin is not produced it's not stimulated mm -hmm. by the written word so you're at a, an immediate disadvantage but the other thing is that these tools become they become almost part of our extended brain and in fact we grow networks to, to 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 use tools that we use all the time and so we're thinking on a screen and we're and we are we're on our own yeah. and we're, we're in solitary mode and you've got this this kind of strange paradox really because we're on our own doing something in isolation and yet we're communicating with somebody else so we're on our own but yeah. in a, a in a socially interactive um situation the other thing of course is that all of these the most of these tools they feel like speaking um because they've become so they, they feel so natural to us um but they're not so you know customer service desks for instance generally have a live chat window but it's you know it's it's a complete misnomer yeah. because it's not live. There's a delay, and it's one mm -hmm. person one person communicates, then the other one does, and it's not chat. It's not speaking. It's writing, uh, and writing yeah. is yeah. You know, that's why uh, one of those interactions might take half an hour, where whereas you could solve a problem in five minutes if you were to actually pick up the phone and speak to that person if they if they gave out their phone number, of course, which these days is uh, often yeah. not the case. Yes, no, exactly. Even these days, I love the I love the people who put uh, we are customer centric on their we website, and then you try to actually contact them, and then if you'd be lucky if you get a live chat, you may get a bot chat to start with. But to your uh, to your point, 
to to your point, Rob, though, is um, you know nowadays when we communicate when we communicate through writing, whether it's sending emails or text messages or whatever. Um, I feel that we rarely give it our full focus because we are, we may be writing an email but looking at something else at the same time. We may be thinking you're know, doing. We love this idea that we're multitaskers, but we're not. We're, we're we're rubbish at multitasking. You know, I always call it like multitasking is doing a lot of things really badly at the same time. Um, but we so we don't give it the focus, and therefore, I mean, this is where a lot of the problems arise from because we don't. Then when you you know the when your email comes back and you don't get the response you're looking for, and then you go back and look at your own email, and then you think, oh, okay, well maybe yeah, I get it. Maybe I didn't uh, express myself clearly. But part of it was I didn't express myself clearly because I was never focused on it in the first place. Uh, absolutely and that issue of multitasking is is um is a crucial one uh, it doesn't come up very often but it's it's is central to to the problem because as you said we 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 we're terrible at multitasking multitasking is a myth that mm-hmm. we we can't multitask um it, it, instead what we do is we multi switch okay so we switch rapidly from one thing to another and every time you switch there's something called the attention residue that there's something that you know is you are still adjusting. So you might start the next task, but you're still processing the remnants of your thinking about the last task. So quite often, what happens is we, you know, we we do something, and then and then usually what happens actually is we we're, we're working on something that may be cognitively demanding, and you're thinking, mm-hmm. oh, this is a bit difficult, or I don't know what to do. I'll check my email. We have this idea that oh, I'll just check for something because we like new things. We get yep. a bit of a dopamine hit when we, oh, I'll, I'll see if I've got an email or I'll, I'll see if I've got a message. Um, and when you do that, you check it, you look at it, you're starting to process it, but you're still partly thinking about what you were doing before. So you're not in the room. You're, you're absolutely right. You're not fully engaged. And yet writing is something that you absolutely need to be 100% engaged with because it's already difficult enough to get it right without mm-hmm. trying to do it while still partly thinking about whatever it was you did before. Yeah, and, and you know from from your background in, in journalism and other things is that, you know, when you go to write something, like I was writing something yesterday for, for something, and, it, and I can't remember how many iterations of it I did, and it was only like a couple of paragraphs, how many iterations of it I did, because every time I reread it or whatever, it wasn't quite working in the way that I wanted to. And I was trying to look at the uh, how it was on the receiving end end of it. Um, and that, I think, is part of the issue, too, is, is you said, you know, we fire and forget. Yeah, um, when I was working in, in publishing, we used to have a saying, which was hard write, easy read. Mm. You know, we have this notion that, that people who are, who are great at communicating and writing can do it easily uh, and that it never really gets that easy you, you know if you're if you're used to working to a deadline if you're working on a daily newspaper then you will just get used to 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 um overcoming you you won't have writer's block that that will be a, mm-hmm. a luxury um but for most people it never goes it never gets to that stage e- even for authors uh, i was listening to an interview with the author michael pollan last week for instance uh, and he was saying that he keeps expecting it to get easier. And he's been doing it for a very long time. And he said, it's not. He said he thought it would be a bit like um, becoming a furniture maker, you know, where where the craft would just be, you know, where muscle memory would take over. And he said, no, nope, every book he, he starts to write is as difficult as the last one. So, yeah, it, it is it, it is difficult and it is something that that we need to take care over. But, but you know, my, my word of encouragement would be, um, don't, you know, don't be, don't take that as a negative sign that you, that you find, find it quite difficult to find the right words, um, because Mm -hmm. it's like that for everybody. Uh, but I would also say that if you find yourself trying to capture lots of nuance, you know, and you're thinking, I want to say this and that, but I also want to get in this bit of information and they might react to that. So I will, you know, as soon as that starts happening, that's a sure sign that you should be speaking to the other person and not writing to them, you know, and, and in that situation, I would, especially if, if, for instance, you're in an exchange that does seem like it's getting a bit tense, you know, mm-hmm. just, just send a message, say, Hey, can we have a quick chat? 
because when you do that, you're, you're usually fine that, you know, your shoulders drop, the other person's shoulders drop. You kind of, you feel better. That's oxytocin washing over you. Uh-huh. And, and, and you, you've then got this, you know, you're then communicating as, as humans evolved uh, in the way that humans evolved to, uh, and you can take advantage of that and you kind of feel yourself, you know, you, you, often you kind of end up going, Oh yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, that's okay. You, you know, and it's, you're using all the tools at your disposal uh, and then you can sort it out and then you can confirm it in an email. And, and particularly mm. in, in sales, you know, if you're, if you're, if you've got a prospect um, and you're trying to close and something seems not quite right. Um, I would, I would, hop on a call you know yeah. and if you're dealing with something that's 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 emotive so you need to put your your um prices up for instance and you need to let them know or or perhaps you know that you need to hand them over to a different account manager or whatever it is um anything that the other that, that the client or uh is likely to have any kind of emotive res- emotional response to however muted Okay, so you know, I, I'm, I don't yeah. think they're just gonna, they're just, you know, they're just gonna, um, gonna lose it. You know, if they're kind of gonna be thinking, oh, that's that's a bit, oh, uh, okay, that's a bit surprising. You know, right. That kind of thing can chip away at trust. So if it's mm-hmm. emotive, pick up the phone. Um, and or, or, and, or and, and what I was gonna, I was gonna say there, Rob, is we we know instinctively when we're writing something like that i mean we know because that's probably one of the times when we do slow down a little bit and we're a little bit tentative and all of this and we're trying to maybe parse it and dress it up a little but we know it's contentious it's it may be received contentious or maybe contentious when it's received um so your point is a really good one because if you feel like that when you're writing it then as you said you're probably better off um, picking up the phone you, you absolutely that you know alarm bells should ring we do we do get a warning uh with that kind of thing where we don't so much is where we're reacting emo- um, emotionally mm-hmm. to something that's come in or we're reacting emotionally to something else in our environment uh you know it's it, it, if you are if you are upset about something else even if mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with with the, the the message that's just landed in your inbox for instance that there's something called the affect heuristic, which which says that when we're upset, we will look for things in our environment to confirm that we're that we're right to feel upset. <laughs> I mean, the opposite's true as well. You, you know, any right, kind right. of emotion, we just look for confirmation of it. Um, yeah. This even happened to me. You know, I, I, I uh, here in my home office, I was um, in a in a uh, in some, look, looking in some storage under the eaves here, and I stood up and and banged my head on. Uh, on the steel joist above it and Ouch. as as i did that you know i almost saw stars in fact even as i describe it now i can feel a shiver going down <laughs> going down my neck you know it was a it, was, it, uh, it, it hurt and um anyway you know i rubbed my head sat down at my desk um and there was an, a message from a conference organizer in my inbox and i read it and i was really irritated by it and to my shame I replied. I wasn't rude, but I was quite curt mm. in my reply, right. uh, and I was less than constructive, shall we say? <laughs> and you know, twenty twenty five minutes later, when I when I got over the the, the pain and I kind of regained my composure, because it does take a long time if you're upset about anything. Sure. Um, I, I looked at the message again, and I thought, oh goodness, that's that was a completely anodyne email it was you know it's a perfectly reasonable request and i completely overreacted and misinterpreted it uh and you know i had to send an email apologizing so you know if you think if you're sending a message to someone they could be in a traffic jam they could be late dropping the kids off at school you do not know where they're going to receive that message um and they could react badly to Mm -hmm. it but the same is true for for you. you you know we're we're all prone to these these biases um, yeah, and it's so and, easy to misinterpret these things. Well, uh, yeah, no, I was going to say it is so easy to misinterpret and to not. Re- I mean, have you? It's funny. I mean, have you ever seen that? I and mean, we've all been guilty of it. Like when you do, you read something, you interpret it one way, you react to it, you write back, come back, but later on, is, is a, even in your case that you start to go back to the original one, you go, oh, hmm maybe it wasn't meant in that way or maybe oh i didn't notice that bit because we're in we're we're in such a we're in such a hurry to react yeah i you know even knowing what i know 
uh, and writing about this stuff and talking <laughs> about it all the time, uh, I'm still prone to it. I'm still human. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, part of the problem, in fact, central to the problem, is that we don't read what's actually there. We read what we expect to see. And I'd even go so far as to say that most reading is 90% hallucination. And mm. that might sound like an extreme thing to say, and you know, I'm sure it does. Um, but the, the eye, there's the mechanics of the eye. The eye, wonderful though it is, cannot possibly take in and convey all of the information that we see when, when, when we're looking at things. Mm -hmm. so most, of that, most of that information comes from our brain. Most of it is prediction. OK, so if you are, you know, if you're in an environment, what you'll tend to notice is things that have changed mm -hmm. rather than things that are always there. And that's because your brain has a model. It has a map of what it's expecting to see. And it will use the signal from the eye, uh, from the eyes to, to update it. And in fact, in the brain, the, there are the 10 times as many connections from the visual cortex to the mm -hmm. center of the brain than there are from the the, the eyes. So so it, it, it's it, you know and, and going the other way back to the visual cortex. So so it's you know that there's all this information that the brain itself is generating, and in fact when you're reading, there were experiments carried out way back in the 70s where the researchers y y basically replaced most of the text on a screen with complete nonsense, complete gobbledygook. Uh, but wherever the the uh, volunteers in the experiment looked on the screen, they had an eye tracker, and the eye tracker would would tell the computer to put the correct words there. Um, but mm. you know, as the as the people looked around the screen, they saw the correct words, but everything else was nonsense, and they never knew. They never mm. they they never cottoned onto this at all. You know, they that so when we're reading, we just see with the fine focus point of our eye. Is really only a few letters, uh, and it, it's we are, are hopping from from each of these little groups of letters, and in this kind of series of jerky movements, and and what's happening is we're creating a flow of words in our brain, but it's the brain creating it. So the reason I say mm. that is that that's one of the reasons why we see things in. You know, we well, it works two ways. If you get an email, as you said, and, and um, you misread it, that's why you're, you're seeing mm -hmm. what you're expecting to see. Um, but also, if you've written the message or written a proposal, whatever it is, and you're looking at it again, you're ex you're, you're seeing mm -hmm. what you expect to see. You know, you that's why people miss typos yeah. in it, typically <laughs> in titles, actually, uh, because yeah. you know, the bigger the text, the easier it is to miss because it 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 doesn't. You think of a, a letter that's kind of 36 points high, that is, you know, that will only just, that won't even fit in that fine focus point uh, yeah. on the eye, unless you're stood right back, you know? Uh, and so you won't, you definitely won't see the whole word. And that's when you say, how on earth did I miss that typo? It's huge. And it's in the, it's in the title of the, of the proposal. <laughs> that That's why. Yeah, no, I, I know. And I've seen that happen in real life. I've seen somebody stand up in front of a couple of thousand people and spell uh, on their slide have assess spelt wrong with uh, missing one S. So it just comes up. They just have asses up on the screen um, <laughs> in huge, huge letters. <laughs> and that was one of the best ones. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But go, but going yeah. but going back to your just going back to your point as we, we finish up here is um is our brain is is our brains are working working in so many odd and strange ways but to your point like you know we're constantly filling out you know the picture right we're looking at a little bit of the picture and then our brains are filling it out I mean have you ever been reading a news article or a book and maybe you know you fall as you fall asleep reading it but your brain continues right and then when you wake up. Or the next day when you come back to it, you go, where's all that stuff that I read about gone? And you realize it wasn't there in the first place. Your brain just continued creating it. Uh, absolutely. What happens is, is you start, you start a process. And, and, you know, if you're reading fiction, for instance, that's a really good mm -hmm. example because we, we, we like to communicate in stories. We evolved to communicate in stories. Yeah. We were doing that long, long before we ever um, started writing. 
uh, you know, it's a natural way to communicate. And so if you, if you get a good story that and you're reading it, your brain will start to continue and uh, will, will continue yeah. it even when you stop. And it, it will, you know, it will be asking, you know, asking itself what happens next. And in fact, you know, without, <laughs> without straying too far off, that's what worry is. You know, if you are if you are worrying about the future, you're telling yourself a story about the future, you know, but it's mm. a negative story. And, 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 you know, if you're thinking about something that's happened in the past and you're ruminating on it and you're what you're trying to do is you're telling yourself a story and trying to change the ending. You know, so, yeah. so it's you know, it's it's so powerful. It, incidentally, you, you can use that story effect um, because if you tell a story. And the, and the other person listens to a story yeah the, the the brain scanning experiments show that the same areas of the brain light up in the in the storyteller and the story listener so it's a great way to connect with prospects but you can use that in a kind of micro way if you like so instead of saying you know here are the results for last month right uh, you, you know which is just stating a fact you could say i've been looking at the results for last month and i noticed something yeah, yeah, no, you yeah, want to know what, don't you? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. narrative, and you want, and you know, and your your brain is going, oh, what what did you notice? You know, and immediately you're you're engaged, uh, and it's not, you know, if you if you're saying here are the results from last month, then you're presumably going to give them the results, so you're going <laughs> to yeah, yeah. show them what you noticed, you know. But if you <laughs> if you do it the other way around, it's it's a great way to create engagement, uh, and that works that works with the spoken word as well as with the um, written word. Yeah, done. Fantastic, Rob. And I think, I mean, we could go on and hopefully you'll come back so we can get into this in a little more, even even greater depth. But this has been completely fascinating. All of Rob's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Rob, do please tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a writer, as you would have gathered, who, who, who works at the interface between uh, language and the brain, focusing pretty much exclusively on, on written communication. Um, but this is not all theory because uh, before I became a writer, I, I set up a written communication consultancy called Emphasis, and I set that up 24 years ago. Since when it's it's enabled more than 80,000 people around the globe uh, to to transform their written communication. Uh, so it, this is based on commercial reality and what people mm -hmm. are actually writing. This is not all book stuff, um, and that that consultancy is still very much alive and kicking. I, I stepped down as CEO a couple of months ago. Um, but now if, if people want to want to know more about this stuff, I've put together a free training course uh, and uh, people can sign up for that. If they just go to uh, my website, which is robashton.com slash influence. The, the course is called Silent Influence uh, for what probably is obvious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, robashton.com slash influence, and then they'll get a series of, of lessons in their inbox. It's not a marketing funnel. It, I'm just trying to get the word out and raise awareness of this. Uh, and each lesson comes with inbuilt audio, so you can listen to each one like a podcast. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I'd say go there. Yeah, no, and I, w I would really encourage people because here's, here's the sad thing. And I, I always think it's a little bit sad when we come to things like this. The sad thing is uh, if you pay attention to this, you're going to stand out. And that's the reality. You're going to stand out. If you pay attention to your written communication, if you pay attention to how you read things, go look at uh, Rob's course, but you will, you will stand out. And that's a, that's a sad indictment of the world we live in, but Hey, there's an advantage for you. Uh, ab absolutely. You know, and you, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be perfect because as mm -hmm. soon as you start paying attention, start paying attention to this, you, as you say, you'll stand out and you will be, even if you're slightly better than everybody else, but yeah. because you're paying attention to it, you will give yourself an advantage. You know, the horse that wins by a nose wins 10 times as much prize money as the horse that came second by a nose. You know, you just need to yeah. get that, that competitive edge. And this is a very easy way to do it because writing is now the thread that runs through everything. Uh, so yeah. if, you, if you address that, you will improve everything as well. Yeah, and by the way, there's a great book, Eat, Eat Shoots and Leaves. Um, it's a puncture. You probably know that book really well. But basically, I think there's a panda on the front of it, and basically, it's the panda eats shoots and then he leaves. Or if you leave out the comma, he he eats shoots, <laughs> he shoots somebody and then leaves. So it's a bit like uh, Let's Eat Grandma. You know, uh, 
the puncture. But I would highly recommend people, uh, don't let people tell you punctuation doesn't matter because it actually does. <laughs> All right, yeah, well. It, it, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Rob, thanks again. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Yeah.